Okay, we are back and ready to continue. And uh, the next submission is an oral presentation by the Asthma Society of Canada as outlined CMD 15H 2.140. I understand that um, Mr. Oliphant will make the presentation. Over to you, sir. Thank you very, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your public service in uh, working for Canadians in this regard. Um, and thanks for the opportunity for us as the Asthma Society of Canada uh, to offer some comments as you consider the application for the renewal at Bruce Power. Uh, you may be surprised uh, to have had this submission that I suspect we're not one of the usual suspects um, that you have intervening at your hearings, but we are definitely here for a reason. Over the past uh, few years, the Asthma Society of Canada has been repositioning itself to help us better fulfill our vision of every Canadian child and adult with asthma and respiratory allergies living active and symptom-free lives. And uh, we're doing that by taking on the issue of air quality and the environment head on. We are attempting to become leaders in health and environment, specifically linking respiratory health with outdoor and indoor air quality in a meaningful and scientifically defendable way. Uh, first, I need to start a little bit about asthma because most people don't know much about it. It's the core of what we do. Asthma remains a significant individual health and population health problem in Canada. Approximately 3 million Canadians, or about 9% of Canadians, have asthma. As many as 250,000 Canadians face severe limitations in their daily lives because they have a severe form of asthma. And between 250 and 300 Canadians will die this year as a result of asthma. Canada has the fifth highest rate of asthma in the world, and 18% of people with asthma visited an emergency room in the past year. Right now, one in five, or about 19% of boys, and almost 15% of girls between the ages of five and 12 have asthma. It is on the increase, and it is a leading cause for them to visit emergency departments in this country. Almost 32,000 children visited an ER in Ontario alone last year as a result of asthma. Chronic lung diseases, including asthma, cost $12 billion a year, including $3.4 billion direct costs in health care and $8.6 billion in indirect costs. No one knows what causes asthma, uh, but we know it's a combination of both genetic and environmental factors. And at this stage in human history, we can't alter our genes, but we can have an impact on our environment. Very personally, I am one of those three million Canadians who suffer from asthma and also allergic rhinitis. Like most Canadians, I'm dependent on medications for that, reliever and controller medications. And the focus of our organization for the last 40 years was heavily on helping people manage their symptoms through appropriate medications. That, however, is a downstream solution. What we have wanted to do is move upstream to some of the factors that make our lives more difficult and even lead to deaths of Canadians with asthma. Environmental allergies trigger attacks in about 80% of people with asthma. In addition to those 3 million with asthma, another 3 million have significant respiratory allergies, including allergic rhinitis, which you know as hay fever. It's not a trifling problem for people. It means sleepless nights, lost work days, and lower productivity generally. The prevalence of both respiratory allergies and asthma has risen steadily over the last 20 years and is predicted to increase steadily due to climate change and declining air quality, particularly but not exclusively in urban areas. People with allergies and asthma are widely susceptible to environmental factors, including both natural environmental factors like pollen, dust, mold, and other airborne allergens, as well as human-made factors, industrial and vehicle emissions, SOX, NOx, and VOX, as they say, particulate matter, and other forms of air pollution. There is evidence that shows that air pollution most likely is a cause of asthma in very young children. And it dogs us as we get older, hitting us in two ways. First, air pollution stimulates the production of pollen, putting more allergens into the air and irritates our mucous membranes, which intensify our allergic reactions. But it's not only our current rates of pollution are a problem. Climate change, which is at least in 
part due to pollution, will increase allergens in the air and related allergic disease as warmer weather and milder winters can result in increased pollen production in plants and longer allergy seasons. It's also proving to heighten the allergenicity of airborne allergens. In other words, the allergy season is longer than it used to be, and the allergens that are in the air are stronger than they used to be. It's not only pollen that's the culprit, more precipitation leads to more mold, more drier conditions lead to more dust and dust mites, and particulate matter from forest fires um, are as a result of the drier conditions due to climate change. Energy production is a big part of both the problem of climate change and frankly, we believe it's part of the solution when it comes to air quality. Recently, with the closing of the last coal generating power stations, the Ontario government undertook a review of its long-term energy supply and sources. The Asthma Society of Canada engaged in this review, attempting to remind the government that energy choices have health impacts and that air quality should be of prime concern in any good mix of energy sources. We have been advocating that when looking at the cost of energy, it is critical to include the health costs of dirty energy. The human medical cost of burning fossil fuels is staggering. As I've been repeating over this past year, you can choose the food you eat, you can choose the water you drink, you can't choose the air you breathe. The Asthma Society has long recognized the contribution made by nuclear power to clean air. But our work in Ontario's phasing out of coal has pointed out that while conservation is critical and renewables such as solar and wind are extremely beneficial, we could not have phased out coal generation without nuclear power, particularly that provided by Bruce Power. And we will not be able to maintain the amount of energy we need to keep Ontario working, living, moving and developing without a significant contribution from the nuclear industry. Ontario is close to being on target to meet 2014 levels of greenhouse gas emissions and a major contributing factor to this achievement is the progress made in the electricity sector. Through the closure of coal plants, the refurbishment of Bruce Power's nuclear reactors, conservation efforts and the addition of renewables to the supply mix, we are starting to be on target. Outlined in the climate change plan, the electricity sector is again the major area where megaton redu reductions will be a contributing factor to ensuring long-term goals are met. In the short term, the electricity sector may see a slight increase in emissions while the upcoming refurbishment of nuclear reactors occurs during the, the, throughout the province because natural gas re, uh, generation will be relied upon to make up demand when necessary. Without the security of Bruce Power's nuclear output over the next three decades, achieving the ambitious 2050 goals set by the Ontario government may not be possible. And without the Bruce Power site, the province would need to replace 6,300 megawatts of clean, reliable and flexible base load supply that could only be done by reintroducing coal or expanding the use of natural gas, which may be natural but is not clean, which both result in sharp increases in greenhouse gas emissions. With the phase out of Ontario's polluting coal plants now complete, it's imperative that the province stays off coal and not rely further on other fossil fuels such as natural gas. Building a low emissions energy system that grows the economy while protecting the air we breathe will ensure the effort of the coal phase out is not wasted. In December 2013, the Ministry of Energy released its long-term energy plan which indicated refurbished nuclear is the most cost-effective option available to meet Ontario's baseload requirements while producing no discernible greenhouse gas emissions. The refurbishment at Bruce and Darlington need to be coordinated to ensure continued system reliability during the refurbishment period and stability of price given the high volume of low cost nuclear output. For the refurbishments of Bruce and Darlington to have the highest chance of success, the full capacity of nuclear industry will be required. In short, we are a health charity advocating for and speaking with people who have asthma and respiratory allergies. We are advocating for clean energy as an important part of the energy mix that will keep Ontario going. And we believe that the nuclear industry is critical to ensuring that people with the health concerns that we advocate for are satisfied that Ontario will be a safe and healthy place to live and to grow. Thank you. Thank you.